right, hello everyone, and welcome to the University of North Carolina at Charlotte's 3MT competition, also known as Three Minute Thesis. So my name is Miranda Rouse, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies today. I'm adjunct faculty here at UNC Charlotte in the Communication Studies Department. I also am an associate in the University Speaking Center, which is located here in the library on the ground floor. And that's a free resource for all students to work one-on-one -on -one with a peer. I also work part-time at a nonprofit radio station, WGFY, as their fundraising and community coordinator. Also, I'm a formal, former 49er and also worked with the Center for Grad Life as a GLF. So speaking of the Center for Graduate Life, we would like to thank the Graduate School and the Center for Grad Life. So if we could just give a quick round of applause for them putting this event together. All right, I'm going to start by giving you a quick background of the 3MT competition itself, and then we will go into more details. So the first three-minute thesis competition, also known as 3MT, was held at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008 with 160 research higher degree students competing. In 2009 and 2010, the 3MT competition was promoted to other Australian and New Zealand universities and then developed into a multinational event. So since 2011, the popularity of the competition has increased and grown, and the three competition, 3MT competition, excuse me, is now held in over 350 universities across over 18 countries worldwide. The three-minute thesis competition celebrates the exciting research conducted by graduate students. In three minutes or less, the participants must effectively explain their research in a language that is appropriate to non-specialist audiences. The preparation and presentation combines the academics with their research and communication skills. This competition gives students an opportunity to publicize their research and also show themselves as researchers. So now let's go ahead and meet the judges for our competition today. All right, first we have Shahara Gurr. She's a 2017 UNCC Graduate School alumna, and she works as Senior Industrial Organizational Analyst for the NBA. So Shahara. <laughs> Next we have Cynthia Wolf Johnson, who is a former UNCC Associate Provost for Academic Services here on campus. We have Michelle Harris, who is a training designer for Harris Teeter. We also have Karen Arrington, who is an associate director in the center, in the career center. Excuse me. She will be filling in for Christy O'Connor today. And lastly, we have Lauren Shibbs, who is the baseball coach here at UNCC. So now we're going to go over the rules for the 3MT competition. So each participant must present within three minutes or less with the use of one single presentation aid. The participants will be timed and if they exceed the three minutes then they are disqualified. Today the competitors will be judged on two different criteria. And the first one is going to be on comprehension and content. And this means, did the participant follow a clear and logical sequence? And was the thesis, key results, research, and outcomes significant and communicated in a language appropriate to non-specialist audiences? The second part will be engagement and communication. 
And this includes, did the presenter capture and maintain the audience's attention? And did the PowerPoint enhance the presentation? All right, so now we're going to discuss the prizes for today. So there will be three prizes, the first being the People's Choice, then we have runner-up, and we also have first place. The first place winner will receive travel funding to attend the regional competition at the Conference of Southern Graduate School in Knoxville, Tennessee this February. The judges will have two minutes to write comments following each presenter, and after each participant has presented, the judges will deliberate and tally all scores for the first place and runner-up winner. The People's Choice Award is going to be decided by you, the audience. Ballots will be handed out and collected and tallied while the judges are deliberating. So we encourage that you all stay to the very end so that you can cast your vote for that. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and get started with our first competitor, which will be Sarah Abdullahi. everyone, my name is Sarah Abdullahi. I'm from the Department of Computing and Information. And my research is about designing AIs which are able to read your emotions and use them. So um, I assume all of you have some experience with collaboration of some sort, or at least observed people collaborating on tasks. I want to ask you to raise your hand if you care about how your collaborator understands your feelings and cares about the interactions they have with you. And is not all just about the task. Would you raise your hand if you care about that? Yeah, good. Uh, I bet there is no one here who says, I actually like a crazy collaborator who doesn't care about my feelings, and there's someone like the Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory series who is not understanding of anyone, and that's the perfect person I want to work with. So when people collaborate with each other, they look into two main processes unconsciously, of course. One is the function, the task they're performing. The second one is the interaction they have with their collaborators. But for some reason, so far, when we have been looking into AIs, we skipped one of the two. We only focused on the function, and we tried to make our AIs smarter and smarter without thinking, okay, these AIs are going to supposedly work with human beings, and they need to understand them. So we are designing basically annoying AIs. So what's the solution here? Uh, what I'm proposing for my research is actually the path science fiction is going. Just this like the comedy where we get all those annoying characters, science fiction is always great with suggesting very interesting ideas ahead of all of us. And one of the things they're very much focusing on is AIs with capability of reading emotions and responding to emotions. And that's what I'm presenting a model based on. Uh, an AI which can capture your, em your emotions through different technologies existing out there, like eye tracking, like different uh, temperature capturing, and so many technologies we have, face, uh, face recognition, all sorts of technologies, and then use that captured emotion to decide, okay, what's my collaborator's state, and what's the next step or state I want my collaborator to move into and how I want to maintain that through uh, changing the emotion. That's what I'm mostly focused on. Thank you for your attention. All right, up next we will have Aksha Ayanchira. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Akshay. And I'm here to present my ongoing research topic, which is augmenting reality for emergency evacuation. So to start with, Mr. Tony Stark's image has nothing to do with my thesis. But I purposely kept it here to convey how fascinated we are watching sci-fi fantasy movies like Avengers. Because it makes us think if something of this kind is doable or not. So one day, uh, me, my professor, and my lab mates were sitting in our lab thinking if we can use the technologies that we have to help save some lives. So we went forward with one of the biggest concerns, the fire hazard. We pulled up last year's stats from NFPA website, and these are some of the figures that we got. It says that 
more than 13 million calls were registered last year across US, out of which 5 lakhs buildings actually caught fire. So 5 lakh buildings in a year is like saying, by the time my speech ends, we will have three buildings already catching fire. Yeah, and that's how bad the situation is. So to learn more, we called five officers from Charlotte Fire Department to our lab and asked them questions like, what difficulties they face? Where do things go wrong while performing a rescue operation? And they came up with three strong points. One is sometimes they ended up going to a wrong address, a wrong lane altogether. So that's a disaster. Second one is, even if they find a building, it's difficult to locate where the people are inside a building. And third, when they get trapped inside, it becomes difficult for everyone to find an evacuation path. So to tackle this, we proposed a solution where a trapped user's smartphone can synchronize with HoloLens. HoloLens is this device, which will be worn by a rescue coordinator. And when these devices sync with each other, rescue coordinator can not only detect where a building is in a particular area, but also precisely see where each user is moving inside a building. May it be a small house or a four-floor university building. And we are not stopping there. We are keeping the software framework open for multiple types of input parameter. For example, this is the fourth floor of Woodward Hall that we modeled. In Woodward, we have many cabins and labs equipped with heat sensors. Now, that is a good extra parameter we are working on. Using heat sensor information, we can identify which all areas are already affected by fire. And we can prevent users from going there. And Using the same information, we can also predict the best possible evacuation path for everybody to come out safe as early as possible. Using this, like uh, the officers were impressed, and they want this kind of technology to be integrated as soon as possible in their helmets. And using this thesis, I believe I will be able to help our real-life Avengers, the real-life heroes, to a great extent. Thank you. <laughs> I you're fine. You got excited. You got excited. All right, up next we will have Gizam Bushak Zilar. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm interested in collective behaviors, especially in collective behavior, collective decision makings in our society. Think about it. You are walking on the street. Should I go right? Should I go left? You know, we don't know. So every time, maybe we are making decisions collectively. But especially when it comes to for the same cause made us together, it could be for protests. This image is from after school shootings, students came together and went out to show their reaction. Unfortunately, it was a sad, of course, it was a sad emotion, but at the same time, they wanted to come and show their reactions on the streets. What they did, some of them have their banners. They wanted to show, you know, with their banners, I'm young, I'm angry, and I'm ready for change right here, right now. But some others, they want, they, as you can see in this, you know, yellow squares, they are with their phones. They are, they are texting, they are posting, or maybe they are tweeting. And out of, outside of this arena, also there are other people who are talking about this issue. So who are they and what they are talking about? We are looking for their social media data because they are sharing on that, especially for Twitter. What I have for my research, we have two different data sets from Twitter. First one is for, from Charlotte, which was after a police shooting of Key Iman Scott uh, in 2016. We had a week of protests. And also we have another data set from Charlottesville in 2017 after Heather Hare was killed by a country protester. So we know that users are sharing their emotions and thoughts through their posts. And also they have their influence level on their posts, who they are mentioning. Mentioning, right? They mention some influential people, or maybe they are mentioning, or they are mentioning other public users like us. So, who are these influential people? It could be, you know, media channels like uh, the New York, New York Times or Fox News, or celebrities, or as you know, politicians. Uh, on the other hand, they mention public users as well. We can extract this information through their posts. We know that who they are mentioning and how many times they are mentioning, right? We, this, we have this network. And I would like to understand, and also we can detect their emotion through their posts, especially for protests when it comes to its anger. It sparks, with, it sparks with anger and it dies out. Why do they die out? And we can understand maybe through this network, extracted network, how they interact with each other and how, uh, and how different theories can tell us different stories. And when it comes to sustainable change, with these interactions, I would like to see the dynamic behind the behaviors of users 
and people in the system to see the sustainable change. Thank you so much. <laughs>
My county resilience condition model includes four variables. Environment, it looks at the different natural resource types and land uses across the US and in the 10 FEMA regions. Social, which looks at the different population demographics of urban, rural, and suburban communities. Environment, I'm mean, excuse me, economic, which looks at the different economic conditions that may or may not influence a community's ability to live with and prepare for a disaster. And infrastructure amenities, such as broadband communications, cell towers, and highway connections. My qualitative research includes interviews with select FEMA region leaders and a North Carolina multi-county regional disaster plan community. The purpose of my research is to inform and empower communities across the rural urban continuum, particularly the people that live there every day and their disaster planning entities, with how they can partner together for resilience with their neighbors. We are going to have to learn to live with natural disasters. And resilience requires partnerships, not only after disaster strikes, but before it ever comes. Thanks for listening. All right, next we have Jack Clincham. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Lynchum, and I'm a current second year doctoral student in the Organizational Science Program, which studies organizations and their employees and how we can improve their health, well-being, and effectiveness. Today, I'd like to pose a question that's the basis of my thesis, as well as my talk today, which is, how can we help those with health problems better do their job? Now, I'd like to start with a few definitions of key variables within my model, which you can see up here on the screen. First, I'd like to start with my outcome variable, which is perceived workability. Now, this is an employee's perception of their ability to do their job, which is based off their resources, meaning their work demands, in which these resources can come from themselves, such as their health, as well as outside sources, such as supervisor support. Now, a lot of variables have been shown to be related to perceived workability, but one that I'm focusing here on my model is coping strategies, and specifically, selection, optimization, and compensation strategies. I won't go too in depth about what these strategies involve, but essentially, they're establishing a person's goals and then optimally allocating their resources to meet their demands. Now, intuitively, it makes sense that using these coping strategies should lead to higher levels of perceived workability. However, this isn't true in literature. It's inconclusive, with some researchers finding this and others not. So, the basis of my thesis is testing a combination of two new variables to test whether or not this relationship exists. First, I have health, in which I argue that lower perceptions of health acts as a limitation on one's resources, in which it's harder for them to meet their work demands. In this way, they'll have lower levels of perceived workability, which should be mitigated by these coping strategies. Next, we have job control, in which this is the extent to which an employee feels that they have control over the work that they do. You can kind of think of this like a boss micromanaging an employee, in which they would not have high job control. Now, I argue, and the research supports, that high job control is needed for these strategies to be implemented into their work. So, going off of this, I'm testing the relationship between these coping strategies and perceived workability and arguing that they will be most strongly associated together for those with low health and high job control. In this sense, because those with low health will have limitations on their resources and benefit more from these strategies, as well as high job control so they can actually implement these into their work life. Now, this has implications for both theory and practice, such that we can better understand when this relationship exists, as well as we can teach these, these coping strategies to employees, as well as we can find ways to implement and increase job control within certain occupations. And in this way, we can help those with health problems better do their job. Thank you. All right, up next is Anandito Ghosh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anindita Ghosh. I am a third year PhD student in the Department of Biological Science. So my research work focuses on the development of infant leukemia, that is the blood cancer in infants. So before going to my research, I would give a little brief background. So DNA breaks uh, by external factors, such as chemical agents and then radiation factors. Following the DNA break, there are two pathways can get started. One pathway, the normal repair process occurs where the certain proteins are involved. In another pathway, 
this is the error prone repair, the certain proteins are involved and DNA is repaired in this way. So in the normal repair pathway, uh, it is um, no problem afterwards and everything becomes normal. But if this error prone repair pathway start working, then what happens is chromosomal translocation or, as, or rearrangement at the level of DNA issues. That is part of one broken DNA binds with part of another broken DNA, which you can see from that picture on the top left corner. This is called chromosomal translocation. And following this translocation, abnormal proteins are generated, which can highly uh, influence the process of cancer. And most of the hematological malignancy are thought to be occurring due to this process of translocation. But I will not talk about all the hematological malignancy, just the malignancy that is uh, happening in the infants. So studies have shown that pregnant mothers who consumes genistein containing product, which is abundant in tea, caffeine, soy product, energy drinks, their babies develops the DNA break intrauterine. And this DNA is repaired in this error prone pathway. Following that, this uh, error prone pathway repairing, those babies develop this uh, chromosomal translocation. And as a result this, of this translocation, they develop a protein which uh, abnormally influences the blood cells and gives rise to leukemia. And this can be diagnosed in babies as early as three months to one year old. That is devastating for the family and for everyone. So my study focuses on why and how genistein simply uh, like looks like a very naive and natural normal product guides this process. So in the lab, I used the embryonic stem cell, which are genetically engineered, and they have this uh, green protein inserted in them. When the translocation happens, they develop these green colonies. So these cells, I collected these cells after the treatment to genistein and confirmed, yes, the translocation process is happening following the treatment to genistein. After collecting the cells, I saw the protein levels of this normal pathway decreases, but the protein levels in this normal, abnormal pathway increases significantly. Okay. All right, our next contestant is going to be Donna Goodnow. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming here today. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard at some point in their lives, take your vitamins, they're good for you. Well, I'm going to tell you why that may not be the case. So we look at a class of chemical compounds called bioflavonoids. These are found naturally in fruits and vegetables, but they can also be found at very high concentrations in dietary supplements, which are those vitamins you're taking. These chemicals would thought to be good for you, of course. However, the reason we're interested in them is because they have a very similar chemical structure to a known chemotherapeutic called atopicide. Now, atopicide is great for killing cancer cells because it damages the DNA. However, when it damages the DNA of normal cells, you can have chromosomal translocations, which are when two chromosomes swap their DNA with one another. As you can tell by the chromosome's face on my slide, this isn't very helpful for the chromosomes and it's not good for the cells either. When this happens to normal, cells with atopicide treatment, you can get secondary cancers such as leukemias form. This isn't good, right? So what my research is focusing on is looking at bioflavonoids and looking to see if they damage the DNA like atopicide does and is it if they cause chromosomal translocations. So in the first four pictures in the middle, you'll see blue pieces, areas, those are DNA molecules. And then in there, you'll see green dots. That represents an area of DNA damage. What we found is atopicide does extensively damage DNA, but two of our other groups, which are our bioflavonoids, also highly damage DNA. We also use, in these bottom two pictures, a cell line that fluoresces green or glows green when a chromosomal translocation occurs. So what we've actually found is bioflavonoids do cause DNA damage and they do cause chromosomal translocations. Why is this all important? Because pregnant women taking these vitamins and supplements are exposing their embryos, their developing babies, to bioflavonoids because they can cross the placental barrier. Now when these embryos are exposed to bioflavonoids, chromosomal translocations can occur and that could lead to infant leukemia. 
As a matter of fact, in Asian countries where they have a very high intake of soy, which has a lot of genistein in it, they have actually two to three folds higher incidence of infant leukemia. So the idea behind my project is to look at how these bioflavonoids are damaging the DNA and how they're causing these chromosomal translocations so that we can hopefully prevent that in the future. Thank you very much. All right, our next participant is Hyunjae John. Thank you. So, hello, my name is Hyunjae John again, and I'll be talking about the first part of my dissertation project titled as Acute Deformation of Telfemoral Cartilage Following Three Different Rehabilitative Movements in Patients with Telfemoral Pain. That's very long. Yeah, but what is patellofemoral pain? It is a basically pain in the knee, behind the kneecap. And it, it is very prevalent in America. So up to 31 million Americans are reported to have knee osteoarthritis. And uh, according to the CDC, the socioeconomic burden is up to $300 billion. So to deal with that epi epidemics, lots of treatments are given to knee osteoarthritis patients. So for the exercise part, uh, there are some uh, movement modifications or lower extremity strength exercises used. And they were reported to be very effective in treating their pain and also improving their functions. But we still don't know what's actually happening inside a joint. So we should be able to know what is actually those exercises are doing to our joints, especially cartilages. So to Im image those joint cartilages, there are many different imaging techniques can be used, x-rays, MRIs, and also ultrasound. But uh, as you can look at here, uh, now we are seeing the uh, uh, cartilages and uh, patellofemoral pain being early osteoarthritis that fits into this red box. So x-rays can measure the cartilage thickness, but early osteoarthritis, they don't suffer the cartilage thickness differences. All that changes is their morphology so that they lose uh, uh, their uh, shock absorbing cap capabilities and also lubricating the joint. So I chose the ultrasound to measure their cartilage thickness difference after those rehabilitative exercises. So this is one good example of those images. So upper area, which is, comes out uh, white, is your muscle. And bottom area is your bone. And between the gap, there is cartilage surface, cartilage spaces. So by measuring the distance between those areas, you can measure the cartilage th uh, thickness. So I, so far, I could collect six persons data and patellofemoral pain patients uh, showed a greater decrease in the cartilage thickness and also increased pain. So that'll be interpreted as uh, exercises are bad. But actually, let's take a look at it long term. So what if they get the exercises for a long period of time? Will that, be, will, will that end up with uh, better outcomes, such as less reduction of the cartilages and also uh, lesser pain. Thank you. Okay, our next participant is Prem Pugalanti. Let us engage in a thought experiment. Imagine a utopian future where you can do whatever job you want. Your salary is not determined by your job or your qualification. At the end of each week, you go to a movie theater, watch a movie, and then come back and take a multiple choice exam. And the performance on the exam determines your salary for the next week. And you keep doing this for the rest of your professional life. In such a scenario, I have a question for you. Would you be enjoying the movie like you're supposed to? Or would you be thinking, um, the green color of the villain's car, would it be on the exam? That's exactly what is happening to our students in our classroom. They are learning to take an exam. I'm sure many of us can relate to that. STEM educational reform has been argued to, for, as a solution for this problem by providing context to the basic science and math that the students are learning in the classroom. And my research is trying to figure out how such STEM classrooms should look like. Logically, I looked at the literature. The literature says the teachers of such STEM integrated classrooms are having difficulties in integrating engineering and technology with science and math because they lack an understanding of the naturally existing relationships between these subject areas. So I proposed to view these subject areas as smaller subsystems that make the larger system called a STEM. 
So the idea is learning in one affects the learning in the other. So to test my hypotheses, I assembled a team of subject experts and the classroom teacher, and we designed a set of instructional tasks for a math classroom with an engineering problem as the context. We conducted the experiment in the classroom, and I observed two major findings that indicated a success of my experiment. The first is with the teachers. The teachers were able to see the naturally existing connections because they were seeing them as interrelated to each other. So they were able to integrate it at much deeper level and to provide real world context for the abstract con concepts that the students were learning. And for students, their, in their interest was increased because they were reinventing the co mathematical concepts instead of someone telling them what it is. This is important not only for teachers, but also for administrators, for policy makers, and even for parents to create classroom environments that are conducive to true meaningful learning, where a student is not wondering, why do I care that the sum of the internal angles of a triangle is 180 degrees? Thank you. All right, our final participant today is going to be Vidushni Sirnavansan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vidushni doing my master's in computer science, and my thesis topic is emotional natural language generation. As you all know, language is a very important tool to which humans communicate with each other. I'm trying to develop a conversational agent or a chatbot that could give emotional response or it could respond with empathy. So, how many of you have been pissed off with automated customer service replies? <laughs> so, especially when you lodge a complaint and you get a reply saying, I can't understand, please tell again. <laughs> that's really dumb, right? So, that's what that's why emotional intelligence is very important, and that's what my research focuses on. So now let's start with a simple example. Today is a wonderful day for me. There are eight different ways in which a human could respond to this simple prompt. Say, OK, good, glad to hear, and so on. So how does a human learn to respond? Is there a way to model this learning process? Fortunately, the answer is yes, and that's why my research is possible, and I'm standing here today. So let's start this, uh, understanding this with a simple learning process. Like, I would just map my uh, model with human brain. Um, so the neurons in brain can be mapped to the neurons in the neural network, which are the layers of circle as seen in this image. So each circle here is a neuron, which are the basic computational units of any neural network, and they could capture complex patterns similar to neurons in brain. Though they are powerful, generating responses that could mimic human is very difficult because we require a huge amount of data to train our model, and there is no one correct response as we have seen here. So we end up generating dull responses like I don't know, I can't understand most of the times. And also the generated responses are ungrammatical and they lack emotional aspect. So I proposed my reinforcement learning system, which could be thought of as a learning process where humans learn to respond with appropriate emotions. I have modeled appropriate heuristics like ease of answering that could avoid dull responses, semantic coherence that could generate messages or responses that are coherent and grammatical, and emotional intelligence that tries to match the tone of the incoming message with a generated response. For, so for instance, a friendly message would elicit a friendly response. And I have also added a human feedback component that would make my model generate messages more close to a human. In this way, my model could generate more diverse, interesting, and emotionally appropriate responses. So now, it's time to ask for yourself. Can the chatbots surpass human expectations and replace humans someday? Well, that is a critical question to address. Yeah, thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and give all of our participants another round of applause. Great job, everyone. So now the judges will step out to deliberate. And in the meantime, we ask that you go ahead and cast your vote for the People's Choice ballot. All right, again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And now I'm going to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School, Tom Reynolds, to present our winners. And after that, we will have our closing remarks from the Associate Dean, Catherine Hall Hertel.
Well, this is my uh, uh, third event. Well, this is the third time that we've held this event, and I'm really pleased that it gets better and larger every year. And so thank you all for turning out, and uh, um, it was a tough choice, I know, from the uh, recipients. I think I'm supposed to start with the second, the runner-up first, correct? Somebody give me a high sign. People's choice. People's choice. <laughs> People's choice. And this was close. Uh, Schwang Brown. In first place is Schwang Brown. So again, uh, thank you. I'm going to actually now turn the podium over to Catherine Hall Hertel, who is going to uh, give some parting thoughts and also her thanks and congratulations to our recipients. But before I go, please give everybody a round of applause for what a great job. Thank you. I think this is a really amazing competition for a couple of reasons, but particularly because in our third year, we had such quality presentations. So congratulations to all of you. And I hope that even if you didn't win today, you came away feeling like you've learned something. It's a skill that you can take with you. Um, we're really proud of all of you. So congratulations. The 3MT would not be possible without a lot of volunteer effort. We had um, volunteer judges during the preliminary competitions, but I have to say a special thank you to our judges today for being here because they donated their time and their support for graduate education and we are very grateful, so thank you. And these events don't just happen. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and a lot of planning. So let me extend a thank you to the staff of the Center for Graduate Life. They worked really hard on this event uh, from the start of the semester on. So thank you to everybody who put it together. Now with that said, I'd like to invite you to help us finish off the refreshments, to mingle with one another, and congratulate our winners. Thank you for being here today.